So now guys, let's try and understand the other boosting concept which is called gradient boosting, right? So let's understand that first when intuition and then try and kind of go through the entire diagrams and more intuition based concepts. Let's understand gradient boosting through a more intuitive example first, right? So let's say consider linear regression. So linear regression looks like something like this, right? Theta 1 x, right? So what you're trying to do always is trying to figure out the best possible values of theta, right? Using cost function. So, but you know that your actual values that you get out of this is not exactly correct, right? So you have y and y hat plus epsilon, right? Epsilon is the error. So this is the error. So for each prediction, you know that it's not going to be correct, right? So what you do is your actual y value is your predicted value plus some error. So your error is already what you calculate as y minus y hat. So this is something you're very familiar with, right? For each data point, you can basically calculate this. y goes to y plus epsilon. For each data point, right, i. For all i, right, so you see this is a part, right. So you know that your final, your actual value of y is basically prediction plus some error. Now gradient boosting basically is built, it, built on this entire concept, right. So your y is basically nothing but your prediction plus some error. So you go ahead and say, okay. Uh, let me try do something which is more exotic than all the exam ensembling techniques, right? Which is basically, you know what, let's try and predict this e error altogether, right? So what you're now going to do is, you're going to say that, okay, I have one model which just predicts my actual prediction values, right? So this is your first linear reg regression model. This is the M1. And then you're going to have another second model, which is another linear regression model which you're going to use for predicting the error itself, right? So your input, so now let's understand this. So your, this is your original data, right? So X and Y. So now let's say again some discrete example that would kind of concrete, sorry, concrete examples that would kind of let us understand this more easily. So these are your X and these are your Y values, right? So say two, three, five, right? And now you have Y prediction values. So now these are your epsilon values, right? So, so the first case, what you did was, so you had your linear regression, which was trained on this, right? So this was your model M1. This was linear regression, which was trained on X and Y, and that gives you the prediction Y hat, right? So now what you're going to do is check the error for each of the data points. What is the error for this? This is zero. This is Y minus Y hat, which is three minus minus five minus two. And this is, so this is 5 minus 8 minus 3, right? So this is our epsilon. Now what you're going to see here, do here is, okay, your y is basically nothing but prediction plus error. So what you're going to try and do now is, in the next step, you're going to try and predict this error itself, right? So now you're going to train your model M2, which is... So what it's going to take is, take input as x and target as epsilon, right? So given any x, you would basically try and predict the error, right? So this is your error and you are trying try predicting from the x. That's all you are going to do, right? So you are basically going to try and predict this. Now, even if your first model was very bad, right? For example, you had like very bad, your error was absolutely high. But if you can predict that error very perfectly, right? If your model M2 is absolutely good, then by combining this two, you would have something which is absolutely good, right? Because even though this is bad, but because this is too good, when you will add them, you would basically your error would be predicted perfectly, right? So even if your final first model has lot of error, but because that error has been predicted perfectly, you would have this final Y value, which is extremely good, right? So that is the whole concept of gradient boosting. In gradient boosting, you're going to start with some model M1 on an entire data set. And your M2 is basically going to be the errors from this, right? So the error from this, and x, right? So this is your x. This is your x, and you're gonna keep the errors from the first model. And together, you're combining the same data. You're gonna have train your M2, right? Now, obviously, the sequential step is you're gonna again have this model. This model would also the errors won't be also be predicted accurately, right? There will be something which is missing among the errors also, right? So what you're gonna do is now have your third model, which basically takes input as the the errors from the previous model and the data set, right, the x. So the x and now your input is x and your target is basically the error of errors, right. 
So that is what is your M3. So M3 predicts basically error of errors, M2 predict, predicts basically error and M1 predicts the actual, Y actual. So that is the whole concept of gradient boosting. You have your first model, so let me kind of... Yeah, so you have your first model which basically makes some errors and what you're gonna do and go ahead is basically take those errors and try your building a second model which basically tries and predict those errors, right? So your first model has model M1 which takes input your input dependent independent features and predicts your dependent features, right? In the second model, you're gonna take your independent features again like what you did, but in case of, instead of predicting the dependent feature, you're gonna basically try and predict the target as error of the previous model, right? So you're taking your input as the independent features and target as the error from the previous model, right? So that's the whole concept of gradient boosting. Now let's understand that. Uh, so this is exactly what you have here, right? So you have first fit a model which is f one x equals to y. Now you basically get the rate residuals, right? So the residuals we already know is nothing but y minus y hat. And now your second model which is f two x would basically nothing but f one x plus h one x, right? H1 is nothing but the one which is the model you have used for predicting errors, right? So that is the whole intuition of gradient boosting. Now let's understand that through a more discrete, like more uh, visual example, right? So let's take this graph of y equals to 3x square parabola, right? So now we are going to try and plot that. So what we have done is for all those data points, we have sampled 100 points and with those 100 points, we are adding a small noise to each of those values, right? You can clearly see here, y is 3x square plus some random value. So now let's look how that would get. So first, to kind of get an idea of this whole intuition, let's first try and run this model, right? Which is for plotting the predictions. So we this is the function that we are going to use for plotting the pr predictions. Now let's first plot your first decision tree, right? So decision tree, remember this, we are using a regression problem. So we cannot use decision tree classifiers, we have to use decision tree regressor, right? Because if you clearly remember what are the X and Y here, again, kind of going back so that you kind of... Your Y and X, Y is a continuous variable. You can clearly see here, right? Y is nothing but 3X square plus 0 0.05 into random noise. So now, as I've already explained, so what we are going to do is first try and train a decision tree regressor. And let's see how that looks. So plotting the decision boundary like this, you get something like this, right? So you see this, this is a red line, which is a prediction and the blue lines are the dots. So you can see the blue lines are in a parabola shape, which is y equals to 3x square. And we have tried fitting a decision tree regressor on that. Thing to note here is, it's not a normal linear regression, so then the predictions don't look like a straight line, right? You can clearly see here the predictions look something which is not a straight line. And this was possible just because we had used decision tree regressor. If you remember, decision tree regressor worked basically on the idea that you have to reduce variance at each step. If you're not familiar, it would be a good idea to kind of go back, have a look into the decision tree regressor, how it worked. But for now, let's and understand, assuming that you kind of have an idea, you can appreciate the fact that this is not a straight line, right? So these are multiple different thresholds, right? For splits, you can clearly see that basically you can make that out because the predictions are the prediction values are changing on both sides, right? So that means those are one of those thresholds, right? One of the splits here. So don't worry much about that if you're not very clear about why this is not looking like a straight line. It would be a good idea to kind of understand that decision tree is a non-linear method. And why is that and how that works, you can check out the lecture, right? So what we have done is here clearly plotted the actual values and we have plotted the predicted values. You can clearly see there are a lot of residual, there are a lot of errors around this particular points, right? So if you calculate the residuals, you can clearly see there would be something which are, which would be really high around this point, right? Around this point, the model is making a lot of errors and so is around this point, right? So now, We'll try and take the Y2, right? Y2 is nothing but the residuals. And we'll try train model on that. 
and now let's see how that graph looks like yeah so this is your zero line as you can clearly see here right so this is zero and you can clearly see most of your values are almost around this particular zero value but around the middle of the graph we had seen right in the middle of the graph the graph was not performing very well right so in the middle of the graph we could see that there are a lot of residuals that are there around here which are non-zero right so the residuals are very high and their values are non-zero around the center of the graph this is something we had already observed now if you try and fit a decision tree regressor again on top of this you can see this is how the green line would look like this is the decision tree regressor fitted on residuals right the error error terms right this is exactly what we are supposed to do right first you have your one model which predicts then you take the error the second model is nothing but predicting that error using the input feature input feature is nothing but the x now if you clearly see if you combine these two models you can see this is much better than the one now if you combine these models you can clearly see your final model is not the final model but this enhanced model is much better right the errors have reduced around here and there are probably some more errors that are happening here but then this number the errors that were here have obviously reduced right so that is something to take away from this is that once you combine the two models you can clearly see your performance has increased now let's try do it the third time right the third time is nothing but we are going to try and take the residual of the residuals right so y3 is nothing but your error from your second model right so the error of error terms right so that is something you clearly see we have calculated here now what we are going to do is basically nothing but train another reg another regression model which takes as input x and the target variable as y3 and now let's try predicting a token value right for any new prediction we what are we going to say is that your final prediction is nothing but your sum of your first model prediction second model and third model i had already explained to you here right why you need to take the sum right so this is what you need so what you're doing is your prediction is basically nothing but your y hat plus epsilon hat prediction plus epsilon double dash epsilon double dash is nothing but the error of errors right so that's all that is that is here we are doing so you can clearly see that value and now let's try and see how this adding the third term how it kind of helped now if you go back to the second graph just kind of so that we can understand what happened in the third model you can clearly see there are some errors here right so there, there are some errors that are happening here right so we have to rectify for those and also probably if possible for this but most importantly there are errors which are happening around here so we have to rectify for those let's see if our if we using a third model can probably rectify for that so as you can clearly see this model has obviously rectified for that so now your decision tree looks very different from what it was earlier and your plot has obviously increased right so you can clearly see here residuals the residuals i had already to told you in the right part of the graph are something which are very high this is a zero line right and most of your values are clustered around zero line except for this part the right part of the graph because we had seen in the previous example previous image sorry graph that uh, there were a lot of residual values around this there are a lot of error values around this and those have been minimized here right so this is now a perfect uh, decision tree regressor when you combine all three of them that's the whole concept right you have one model which is not very good you have the second model which is also not absolutely good and you have a third model which is not very good you combine them and you have something that works absolutely fantastic so now how it is gbm is implemented in sklearn so there's nothing much about it all you have got to do is gradient boosting regressor and then you just specify the decision trees parameter these parameters are exactly same as uh, decision tree except that you have to pass something called n estimators because in this case you are using uh, ensemble of decision tree regressor so you have to say how many night right so you're going to do till prediction error of error error term or error of error error of error of error so how many times do you want to kind of do that whole uh, cycling thing right so that's what you have to specify in n estimators now let's see how the models vary in terms of the decision boundary let's let, let's have a look and see how that varies so there's something that is awesome that has happened here very interesting thing right as you can see on the graph on the left the number of estimators are three and the graph is looking fine but in case of n estimators equals to 200 you can see that the graph is extremely overfitted right now we can let's try and understand why that happened right so so what you did was your y was equals to y hat plus error right and now that was your initial model now in the second model you have something which is y hat plus epsilon hat plus epsilon double dash right 
So this now you are predicting your y as well as the error, right? So obviously you can see that with every growing step, you are basically making the model more and more accurate, right? And more and more accurate on that based on the training data, right? So that is something that we really don't want to do because that might actually lead to overfitting, right? So this is a concept we fairly understand. And that's exactly something that has happened here. As in more number of models, you kind of make it, increase it, it's gonna make your model perform absolutely awesomely on this training data. But it's not gonna kind of generalize well on a test data. And that's exactly the thing that we don't want in real life scenarios. So this is a clear case of overfitting that we have to somehow learn to tackle, right? So now, let's try and understand how do you normally do overfitting, right? The answer to overfitting, tackling overfitting is simple, right? Hyperparameter tuning. That's the same concept we have seen through all the things that we have done till now. In case of random forest, it was prone to overfitting. We did, how did we counter it? Using same thing, right? Using your hyperparameter tuning. In case of decision trees, again, we had saw that they were prone to overfitting. How did we tackle it again? Same concept. Try out different hyperparameters, see what it perfectly fits well on and use those, right? That's the final idea. So use a validation set, check how your model performs with different set of hyperparameters and then based on that, choose the hyperparameter that gives you the best performance. That's as simple as that, but best performance on validation set, right? Just keep that in mind. And that's exactly something that we are gonna do here, right? So improving gradient boost, so there are obviously three top three categories. So there are algorithmic specific parameters which affect the individual tree in the model, which are basically, so this is a decision tree, so there would be the same things, right? So you have your number of samples to be split, max depth, all of the sim specific things which are very specific to each of the tree. The training parameters, right? Which is basically learning rate, the loss function to be used, all of that. And then the finally parameters which are apart from all of this, which can control, right? So that is something we have already seen here. So these are all some of those parameters and you can clearly understand those are. So, uh, so now we are almost done with the end of the session. The only thing to understand here is there's something which is called XGB boost. Now you can clearly understand the major problem with GB boost and for that matter boosting as such is this whole idea that all of these models are sequential, right? So you have a training model, so data, and then you first fit your model M1. Then you fit your model M2, which basically rectifies for error made by M1. Now this is not like bootstrapping or pasting, right? In bootstrapping and pasting, you could just take all of these models, M1, M2, M3, and train them parallelly, but not here, right? Here you have to kind of train your model M3, which rectifies for error made by M2, right? So this kind of a thing, which happens in sequence, you cannot parallelize. And that's the biggest problem with GB boost, or for that matter, all, all kind of boosting, right? So that's something that has been solved by this exceptionally awesome library called XGB boost. So frankly, this is nothing but a lot of engineering optimization, engineering uh, gimmicks, I would say, which kind of helps you do this gradient boosting. Currently, if you try doing this SKLearn, using SKLearn on your laptop, if you have a sizable data set, say around 30,000, 40,000 data, you would very easily understand why is it so painful, right? So try doing that at your end if you kind of want to get an idea how tough it is to do gradient boosting normally. So that's why we need something which is much more op optimized for performance and accuracy. Log on to Grey Atoms learning platform to unlock more free content. Subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon for regular updates.